All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming today. Let me share my screen real quick, um, and then I'll kind of give you an overview about what we will be discussing today. So let's see. All right. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. I am really excited to share my research with you as part of the Wisconsin Science Festival. So today we'll be talking about hibernation, how hibernators survive the winter, how their gut microorganisms are involved in this process, and what this all means for improving space travel in human medicine. But before I jump into talking about hibernation, I just want to briefly introduce myself first. My name is Edna Chang and I'm a microbiology PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm originally from Michigan in the Detroit suburbs, um, so I'm very much so a Midwest girl at heart. And I did my undergraduate at the University of Michigan where I studied the microbes living in the Great Lakes to help understand how we can keep lakes healthy. For my PhD, I decided to come here to Wisconsin and I became fascinated with hibernating animals and the microbes that live inside them which is exactly what I am studying to earn my PhD. So I'm really excited to share with you today two stories of, about hibernation. But before I jump into that, I want to take a quick moment to make a land acknowledgement. Uh, this is something that I think is important to do in all of my presentations. And I think this is particularly relevant since this past Monday was Indigenous Peoples Day. So Wisconsin is home to the greatest indigenous diversity east of the Mississippi River. Um, within the borders of the state are 12 American Indian nations, 11 of which are federally recognized. And more specifically, McFarland, Wisconsin uh, occupies the homelands of the Kickapoo, Peoria, Sauk and Meskwaki, Miami, Ochedi Shakoan or Sioux, um, and the Ho-Chunk nations. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the history of the Ho-Chunk Nation um, because the nation was forced to cede their territory in 1832. Um, and they endured decades of ethnic cleansing and forced removal by both state and federal governments. These attempts were unsuccessful. And as said by Dr. Amy Lone Tree, who was a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, Wisconsin is their beloved homeland. And their fight to remain there is such an incredibly important story. So the reason I'm including this land acknowledgement is more than just because the Ho-Chunk Nation and other American Indian nations have played an important role in the history of McFarland and Madison, but also because science itself has a history of colonization, exploitation, and racism. Um, and many of these discriminatory and harmful practices or beliefs do still exist today. So I want to challenge all of us as science enthusiasts to learn more about the American Indian nations, also known as the tribal nations or First Nations. A great place to start is wisconsinfirstnations.org. Um, and I will pop this link into the chat after the presentation. Um, but I really just want all of us to challenge ourselves to reflect on how our historical and current relationships with the First Nations have led to where we are today, whether that means the land on which we live or whether it's the impact on science. By doing so, we can start a conversation that leads to awareness and start working towards recognition and reconciliation. So now I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my two stories about hibernation. So what exactly is hibernation? It is a strategy that some animals use to survive times of high energy demand and low resource availability, such as the cold winter that's right around the corner. To survive the winter, Animals need to consume enough food and water to provide them with enough energy to fuel their bodies and keep them warm. And there are a variety of strategies that animals use to do this, hibernation just being one of them. Some animals will just leave the cold altogether and migrate south to warmer climates like geese. But this strategy requires an immense amount of energy to make their long arduous trip down south. Alternatively, some animals will stay where they are and bunker down for winter by storing food during summer and fall that they can eat throughout winter. A good example of this is the tree squirrel, like the gray squirrel or fox squirrel with the big fluffy tail that you'll often see climbing trees um, and hiding nuts. Um, however, this strategy of storing food still means that you have to deal with the cold every single day. 
So this is where hibernation comes in. Um, and what makes it such a great survival strategy is that it allows animals to stay where they are and minimize the amount that they are actively dealing with the cold. And you can find hibernators widely distributed throughout mammals. There are pouch carrying mammals or marsupials that hibernate like this pygmy possum. And there are even egg laying mammals like this echidna that hibernate. Um, within primates, we even have two species of primates that hibernate, which are the pygmy slow loris and the fat tailed dwarf lemur. However, my hibernator of choice that I study is the 13 line ground squirrel. So these ground squirrels are not the typical tree squirrels with the big fluffy tail that you probably think of when you hear the word squirrel. Um, as I just mentioned, tree squirrels store food rather than hibernate. Uh, and these 13 line ground squirrels live in underground burrows and they do hibernate. The ground squirrels are also often confused for chipmunks, which are another hibernator, but the ground squirrel is much larger than a chipmunk and also has more stripes on its back. And what makes studying these ground squirrels so great um, is that they're likely hiding outside your home right now because you can find them everywhere in Wisconsin and throughout the Midwest. And if any of you are farmers or gardeners, you're likely acquainted with them because they tend to be pests and can really wreak havoc on your farms and gardens. But the fact that these squirrels are so prevalent makes it easy for my lab and I to study them because we get our squirrels from local Madison golf courses. So in May, if you ever see two or three people chasing after squirrels at a golf course, there's a pretty good chance that it's my lab and I doing our research. So, Today, I am going to tell you two stories about hibernation based on my lab and my work studying these ground squirrels. The first story is about how the squirrel host survives winter. The second is about how the squirrel's gut microorganisms or microbiome survives the winter. So my story about the squirrel host begins in the summer, a time of plentitude and feasting. A squirrel needs to consume an enormous amount of food during the summer to build up adequate fat that it can later use for energy throughout hibernation. And in fact, squirrels will typically double their body weight by the end of summer. But once the, or once the weather starts getting cold, that is when the squirrel begins to hibernate. And during this time, it doesn't eat anything and it doesn't drink anything for roughly six months. Uh, which I think is pretty crazy, especially if you think about the dramatic contrast between the summer feasting and now this winter fasting period. During the six months of the sleep-like state of hibernation, the squirrel fuels itself primarily using the fat stores it fills up during the summer. And this is what allows the squirrel to survive winter. Well, kind of, but not really. Uh, because sleeping for six months can actually cause quite a few health problems. So sleeping puts the body at rest and decreases metabolism, the engine that runs the body. This means that a sleeping squirrel uses less energy than an awake squirrel. But sleeping doesn't decrease metabolism enough to allow those fat stores to last the full winter, meaning that the squirrel would run out of fuel and starve before the end of winter. And since the squirrel doesn't consume any food because it's fasting, there's no way for it to gain additional energy to fuel its metabolism. Fasting also means that there is no food and no liquid going through its gut. And this lack of use can also cause problems. So the gut starts to degrade because it's not being used. And more specifically, the gut structure, especially the layer of mucus that lines and protects it, starts to atrophy and the gut will actually become leaky. Additionally, the immune system is weakened. And just as the gut structure degrades because the gut isn't being used, the same thing happens to muscle and bone. Because the squirrel is sleeping and not engaging in much physical activity, uh, muscle and bone start to atrophy, which then leave the squirrel very weak. So then the big question becomes, how does the squirrel overcome all of these problems that come with sleeping for six months? Well, it comes down to the fact that hibernation is much more complex than just sleep. They do share some similarities though. For example, sleeping animals and hibernating animals are both unconscious and both have a decrease in metabolism and body temperature. However, hibernation takes us to a much more extreme level. So the majority of hibernation 
is spent in a state of decreased metabolism or metabolic depression that we call torpor. Um, in our ground squirrels during torpor, they can decrease their metabolism by up to 98%, which causes a dramatic drop in body temperature. Their normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's the same as ours, but in torpor, their body temperature plummets to as low as 39 degrees Fahrenheit, um, or just a few degrees above freezing. Sorry, I think I said 98.6 degrees Celsius. It's Fahrenheit. Everything here is in Fahrenheit. Um, so their body temperature can drop to just a couple of degrees above freezing. Um, and in some hibernators, like the Arctic ground squirrel, their body temperature can even drop below freezing down to 27 degrees Fahrenheit. For contrast, when we humans sleep, our metabolism decreases just slightly, and our body temperature only drops by about one degree Fahrenheit. So the changes experienced by hibernators are much more extreme. Hibernation's dramatic decrease in metabolism and body temperature conserves an immense amount of energy. And this is what allows the squirrels to subsist off their fat stores for the six months of winter. So you can really think of this as being analogous to turning down the thermostat in your home. So during a normal winter holiday, I bet a lot of us would be going on trips to visit family or going on vacation. Um, and I bet most of us would be turning down our thermostat and water heater. Not enough for the pipes to freeze, but just enough to save energy while keeping the house functioning. So just like we turn down the temperature of our homes to save energy, hibernators turn down their metabolism and body temperature to save energy. However, this state of torpor isn't the only thing that happens during hibernation. In our ground squirrels, torpor will last anywhere from one to 24 days, depending on how deep into the winter season it is. And torpor is interrupted by periods of interbout arousal, when the squirrel's metabolism and body temperature return to normal. These arousals are very brief and only last about 12 hours, after which the squirrel will re-enter torpor. And it continues to cycle between torpor and interbout arousals for the entire six months of hibernation. So the next thing I'm gonna show you, I'm really, really excited about um, because I actually have two videos of squirrels awakening from torpor and entering their interbout arousal. And these are by far my favorite thing that I like to share. Um, but before I show you the videos, I want to give you some context about how we captured these videos. So my lab and I, we keep our hibernating squirrels in a dark, cold room at 39 degrees Fahrenheit to mimic uh, the squirrel's natural habitat during hibernation. To capture these videos, we chose a squirrel who was near the end of its torpor period and then brought it into a normal lit room temperature room. And we captured two videos, a one using normal light and then one using infrared light to look at how the body temperature of the squirrel changes. Um, and we filmed the squirrels for a total of 90 minutes, but I've sped that up into a 30 second clip. All right, so this is the first video. For reference, the squirrel's head is on the left side and the squirrel's tail is on the right side. Um, I apologize if the video is a little bit laggy. Um, hopefully it won't be too bad though. So let's go ahead and take a look. So when the squirrel first starts its interbout arousal, there's not a lot of movement in its body, but then gradually you'll start to see these really rapid small movements in the front half of the squirrel's body. And what this is is actually shivering. So just as we humans shiver when we're cold and want to warm up, this squirrel is doing the same thing during its interbout arousal. Um, and most of that movement is located on the front half of the squirrel because this is where all of the vital organs are located. So things like the brain and the heart. So it's really important that the squirrel prioritize warming the front half of its body first. But eventually some of that shivering will travel down to its hind legs and it will somewhat sleepily and clumsily plop itself onto its paws and start moving around. So the next video I'm gonna show you, uh, which is the infrared one, which allows you to see the body temperature of the squirrel, uh, was captured using a very high-tech, sophisticated setup, which is this chaotic mess right here. So what you are looking at is at the bottom, we have um, a squirrel box where we are putting our squirrel in order to film it. And then we have a really fancy infrared camera positioned above that. So the issue with this camera though is that it can't record videos, it can only take photos. So in order to capture a video, 
uh, I decided to grab a small GoPro camera and position that so that it was filming the screen of the infrared camera. So what you have is the top camera is filming the screen of the infrared camera. And then the infrared camera is uh, somewhat precariously balanced so that we can capture the entire squirrel's body. And so I really like sharing this sort of behind the scenes story because I think it does a great job of showing that science requires creativity. And sometimes that comes in the form of constructing a unique setup to film cool videos. All right, and that brings us to the infrared video. So uh, the head is located on the right side and the tail is located on the left side. Lighter colors such as whites, yellows, and oranges represent warmer colors or warmer temperatures and darker colors such as purples and blues represent colder temperatures. So when the squirrel is first entering the interbot arousal, you'll notice that it is much colder than the room temperature um, room around it. Um, but as it starts to shiver, the front half of its body is going to gradually warm up. Um, again, this is because this is where all the vital organs are located. So it's really important that the squirrel warms that first. And at this point, the squirrel's front half of the body is now warmer than room temperature. But you'll notice that on the back half of the body, it's still very, very cold there. Um, yeah, so, so no matter how many times I watch this video, I think it's amazing just to see that really sharp delineation between the warm front half of the body and the cold back half of the body. So the hallmark of hibernation is really the cycling between torpor and interbout arousals. The end of hibernation is marked with the arrival of spring. And by this time, a squirrel will lose an average of a third of its body weight, but this can get as high as half of its body weight. But the squirrel was able to survive the winter by decreasing its metabolism to conserve energy. And in spring, the squirrel can then resume normal metabolic activity and feeding patterns. And hibernators naturally repeat this cycle between feasting and fasting, being active and hibernating every single year. But they aren't alone when they do this. Hibernators and almost all other animals on Earth live in a close relationship or symbiosis with trillions of microorganisms living in and on them. This microbial community or microbiome has become a popular topic in recent years. You may have heard about ways to take care of your own gut microbiome, such as taking probiotics like yogurt or apple cider vinegar to help enrich your gut with microbes that aid in digestion, or taking prebiotics like fiber to encourage the growth of beneficial microbes. And this brings me to my second story about hibernation. Our microbiome experiences everything that we do. And in the case of a hibernator's gut microbiome, this means that all of those natural extreme changes in diet and physiology I mentioned in my first story are also challenges that the microbiome faces. And this is why I find studying the hibernator microbiome so fascinating. There's always a new challenge around the corner that the microbiome has to overcome. So from the perspective of the microbes, food consumed by the squirrel host is also food that they can use for energy. So during the summer season of feasting, when the squirrel is consuming a lot of food like seeds, the microbiome has access to all of this as a rich source of energy. However, the microbiome is faced with some challenges once the squirrel begins hibernating. The squirrel begins to fast, which means that the microbiome now loses a huge source of energy. The squirrel's body temperature also decreases, which drastically alters the environment for the microbes. Most microbes living inside a mammalian host are used to growing at a warm temperature. And in the case of the squirrel, that is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So when the squirrel's body temperature drops to 39 degrees during torpor, this is a huge change that many microbes are simply unable to survive. Combined, these changes mean that we see a huge die-off of microbes in hibernating squirrels compared to summer active squirrels. Many microbes simply can't survive because of this dramatic decrease in temperature and food. So for the microbes that do survive, the question is then how do they adapt to the cold and obtain energy? And this is the question that I get the most excited about as a microbiologist. 
So the microbes have a few strategies that they can use to survive hibernation. First, they can go into their own hibernation-like state. Due to the squirrel's decreased body temperature, some microbes will decrease their metabolism to the point of going into a state of dormancy, just like the squirrel goes into torpor. Some microbes will even go as far as to create structures to protect themselves, called spores. So I like to think of these as little bunkers where the microbes remain until conditions become favorable again, at which time they can break out of the spore and grow normally. For microbes that don't go dormant, there is still a source of energy for them in the gut. And this comes in the form of compounds often secreted by the host. So things such as the mucus layer that lines the gut um, or dead, dead cells shed from the gut's lining. Additionally, that huge die-off of microbes in hibernation that I mentioned means that all of those dead microbial cells can be used by surviving microbes for energy. And actually, all of these compounds aren't only available during hibernation, they're available year-round, which I think is a great demonstration of the diversity of compounds that microbes can use for energy. So during torpor, Microbes survive by going into a dormant hibernation-like state or by subsisting off host-secreted compounds. But as you know, hibernation doesn't just consist of torpor. Everything changes when the host enters an interbout arousal. Since the body temperature goes back to normal, the microbes are back at a temperature where most of them can flourish. And the increase in host metabolism also means that the host is likely producing more compounds that the microbes can use for energy. So for a short 12 hours, the microbes are back in an environment where they can grow more easily, but then the squirrel re-enters torpor and the microbes go back into their dormant state or slow growing state. And it's really the adaptability of these microbes and their various survival strategies that allow them to survive hibernation with their host. So I've told you two stories about hibernation and it's important to remember it's important to remember that they're two sides of the same coin because the microbes and their host work together. The microbes survive hibernation by using compounds from their host, and in return, the microbes produce compounds that the host, uh, that the host can absorb and use for energy. An example of this is work that my lab and I are currently doing to answer the question of why don't hibernators' muscles degrade? Since hibernators aren't consuming food or protein during winter, and they're not physically active, how are they able to sustain their muscle? Well, their gut microbiome likely plays a key role in this uh, by recycling nitrogen, which is a key component of the building blocks of muscle. So nitrogen in mammals is usually excreted um, as metabolic waste in a form called urea, which is a huge component of urine. However, this urea can be recycled by the gut microbes. So the microbes can break down this compound into a form of nitrogen that can be reused and recycled by both microbes and the host. So this recycled nitrogen is used to create the building blocks of muscle, which include amino acids and proteins. These can be used to sustain microbial cells, as well as being used by the host to maintain muscle. And this is just one example of the many ways in which hibernators and their microbiome work together to benefit each other. So that's cool and all, but what does any of this have to do with space travel or human medicine? For space travel, inducing torpor in an astronaut or another organism is called synthetic torpor. And synthetic torpor can not only save a considerable amount of energy and resources, but it can also increase safety for the individuals. And I know the thought of hibernating astronauts may seem really far-fetched or very much so a science fiction idea, uh, but there really are a lot of similarities between hibernation and sleep that make inducing a hibernation-like state of metabolic depression in an astronaut a real possibility. So as I mentioned earlier, both hibernation and sleep are on a continuum of metabolic depression. And one of the main differences is that changes in metabolism and body temperature are much more extreme in hibernation than in sleep. But we can look to large hibernators like bears for more relevant answers about how synthetic torpor in a human would work. So for example, brown bears hibernate, 
but their body temperature only drops slightly. And because the bears are much, much larger than squirrels, they can actually retain more heat because they have a lower surface area to volume ratio. So this small decrease in body temperature still results in a significant decrease of metabolism by 75%. So synthetic torpor in humans would likely be similar to what we see in hibernating bears, with us decreasing our body temperature by just a few degrees, which would still be a substantial decrease in metabolism. And doing this would mean that we can decrease the amount of food, water, and oxygen needed to sustain astronauts. We can also minimize health problems like damage from space radiation because hibernating, uh, hibernating mammals are actually resistant to radiation damage, although we're not entirely sure why that is. And we can also minimize muscle atrophy and bone loss from the lack of gravity in space. And it's not just during long duration space flight where this would be useful, but also in short term situations. So let's say hypothetically, that we have a crew of astronauts at the International Space Station um, and they are getting ready to make a return journey back to Earth. But they discover that their spacecraft has a broken part that needs to be repaired. And the only way to repair this might be to send them the parts in a rescue and repair mission. But that takes time and the crew doesn't have enough food, doesn't have enough water, and doesn't have enough oxygen to allow them to survive until that rescue and repair mission is completed. If we're able to put the crew into synthetic torpor, we can keep them safely in space until that rescue mission is completed, and then they can return home safely. From a human medicine perspective, synthetic torpor can be a safer alternative to therapeutic hypothermia. So therapeutic hypothermia is used in patients with severe injuries like trauma patients to lower their body temperature and metabolism. It's usually accomplished by surrounding the patient with ice, but there are some health problems associated with this treatment, such as irregular heartbeats and even heart attacks. Synthetic torpor can be a safer alternative because it is a controlled decrease of metabolism and body temperature. So the adverse effects that therapeutic hypothermia patients experience aren't present in hibernating animals. Another example of a human medicine application is to study diseases that involve fasting or gut disuse where no food or water enters the gut. So for example, um, there is a treatment called total parenteral nutrition um, that are used by patients who have a non-functional gut or require complete bowel rest. So this means that instead of normally acquiring their nutrients by eating food and digesting it with their gut, they will actually receive all of their required nutrients through an IV. So in both these patients and hibernating animals, their gut isn't used for nutrient processing. And patients receiving this treatment have a more adverse immune response to gut disuse compared to hibernators. So studying the hibernator microbiome can help us understand how to improve the health of these patients by using their own gut microbes. So there's a lot of potential for what we can learn from hibernators and their microbiome and how this can be used to improve space travel and human medicine. I always find it amazing that we can learn so much from these organisms and they're probably hiding right now in our backyards out back. Um, these inconspicuous ground squirrels that we normally don't pay much attention to are experiencing extreme changes in diet and physiology and are living an incredible symbiosis with their gut microbiome. So I hope you walk away today with a greater appreciation for the humble ground squirrel. Understand that hibernation is more complex and interesting than just sleep. And remember that we all live in a symbiosis with our microbiome. And if you're interested in learning more about the hibernation microbiome, um, I actually have a science comic that I made in collaboration with a UW alum, Dr. Jay Gardner, um, with the link shown there, but I will also pop the link into the chat in case you're interested. Um, so this comic was made with a group called JKX Comics, which is a group of scientists who make really cool science comics. 
Um, so if you love good stories and fun art, um, I highly encourage you to check them out because they have a lot of just great science stories that um, are presented in a very unique way in the form of a comic. Um, and with that, I am happy to take questions. Ooh, okay, so I have one question from Alex that asks, do we know anything about the relation of global warming to hibernation patterns? Uh, so that is a really good question. And I think is a, something that hibernation biologists, we've started becoming more aware and more worried about. Um, currently, we don't really know how global warming is going to affect hibernators. Um, and part of that is because like what, what lets a squirrel know when it's time to hibernate um, is something that is very much so probably genetically uh, programmed in them. Because like if we say take a squirrel from Texas and move it up to Wisconsin, it is going to hibernate as if it was still back in Texas, even though it's in Wisconsin. Um, so it's, yeah, so I guess my answer to that is we don't know yet exactly how global warming would affect hibernation patterns, but that would definitely be something that I think more people will be studying moving forward. Um, a question from Peggy asks, is the hibernation the same in other mammals? Um, so yeah, so for the most part, hibernating mammals all go through that cycle of torpor and interbout arousal. Um, the main thing that would change is how long the torpor period will last, like how many days, um, and also how long they actually hibernate for. So like, for example, um, our ground squirrels hibernate for about six months of the year, but the Arctic ground squirrel up in Alaska and Canada can hibernate for up to nine months of the year. Um, so it's all kind of similar, but a little bit uh, specific to the climate in which they're living. Uh, a question from Stephen asks, what triggers the hibernation process and what role does the microbiome play in that trigger? Uh, so that is a great question and is, I think, one of the biggest questions that hibernation biologists haven't been able to figure out yet. Um, we don't really know what triggers the hibernation process, although some work um, looking at the genetics of the squirrel have found that there might be one or two genes that are correlated with when a squirrel would start hibernating. Um, but overall, we're still not conclusively sure what we can say actually triggers that hibernation process. Um, and as far as what role the microbiome might play in that, that is also a giant question mark as well. I, I think that we need to first figure out what on um, the squirrel's part in its genetics is triggering the hibernation process. And then from there, um, we can then look into how the microbiome may be contributing to that. But for now, we are just all trying to figure that out as hibernation biologists. All right, and then I'll just point out that I dropped in the link to WisconsinFirstNations.org, um, as well as a link to the Science Comic website that I had mentioned. Okay, a question from Katie asks, where do brown squirrels hibernate? Uh, I'm curious about where in a backyard would be a good place to hibernate. Um, yeah, so our or rather the squirrels that I study, they like to, they tend to live in like grasslands, wide open areas, um, which kind of makes sense why they are found throughout the Midwest. Um, and they will pretty much live in burrows that can be pretty deep and pretty complex. So they will bury themselves in the burrow and kind of hibernate while they're there. Um, as far as where in your backyard they might be hiding or hibernating, um, I, I think if you don't have a lot of vegetation in your backyard or it's mostly just grasses and not a lot of trees, um, those are probably the good places where a ground squirrel might choose to go to hibernate.
so this is Anne from the library. And if anyone has any more questions, you know, feel free to 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 work them in still. But I did want to be sure to thank Edna and everyone for coming today. This was fascinating, and I really appreciate this. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, and thank you everybody for for attending. I hope that you walk away with a little bit more enthusiasm for hibernation. Oh, okay, we have a question from Peggy um, who asks, do some animals give birth while hibernating? Um, and yes, so bears are a good example of an animal that does give birth while hibernating. Uh, most ground squirrels do not. They wait until after hibernation to mate and then have their litters fed. Um, but most bears, yes, do give birth while they're hibernating. All right, a question from Ashley asks, understanding how gut biome works during hibernation, could that potentially help understand how to reestablish the human gut biome? Oh yeah, that is a really good question. Um, so I guess thinking about learning how to reestablish the human gut biome, um, I think that where understanding the hibernator microbiome would be most beneficial, would be in patients who um, are not using their gut. So kind of that um, treatment where I mentioned earlier where some patients don't eat food and just get all of their nutrients through an IV. Um, I think that would be a really good example of where learning about the microbiome and hibernating mammals can help human medicine um, because you know both animals and those patients are not using their gut to digest any food or to process nutrients. Um, so yeah, that, I think that's one of the goals of the research that I'm doing, concentrating on the microbiome, is hoping that what we learn here can then be applied to help patients like that. So I think we'll wrap it up there. And thank you again so much. Please check out the links that Edna shared in the chat and take care, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks everyone. Have a good day.